So thanks, thanks everybody. I'm uh, pleased to be here to uh, introduce the third extract package for survival extrapolation. So I'll start by giving a quick explanation about what survival extrapolation is, in case you're unfamiliar. So the, the idea is we have some short-term data on time to an event, typically death. So on this graph here is a Kaplan-Meier estimate of survival. People have been followed up for three years, but somebody wants to make a decision about a policy based on longer term survival. So the idea is that you know, the consequences of that policy decision will last longer than the end of that data. So the, the decision, decision maker can't just you know, throw their hands up and say, no, this is all we know. They've got to say something sensible uh, and give some judgment about the, the longer term. So this is a very common problem in HTA, in health economic um, decision modeling. Uh, but this is the point to admit that I feel like a bit of an imposter here because I don't work in HTA. I work in uh, population health. And it turns out that there's kind of similar problems um, occur there. So we were working on COVID. And in the first few months of the, of the, the pandemic, we um, were answering questions about burden on, on hospitals. So we had data on length of stay in hospital. And we wanted to project, you know, how long are people going to spend in hospital over the next few months? But we had data where on hospital stay where people were still in hospital. This is right censored time to event data. So the event was discharged from hospital. So the different um, questions come up in different areas on a lot about long term policy decisions. So the thing that the policymaker is interested in is the mean survival here, it's the area under the, 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 the curve. So it's the expected time to the event which is kind of equivalent to knowing the, the total over a population. So this estimate is not provided by um, non-parametric and semi-parametric methods for survival analysis, um, except if you just truncate your estimate to the um, length of the data. You, you want a long-term projection. And those long-term um, projections of expected survival um, are provided by fully parametric models for that time to end events. So this is all about fully par parametric models. There's many choices for how to specify fully parametric survival models. So here's, a, here's an example. There's a very simple survival models, viable distribution. So on the left, we've got the survivor function extrapolated from this you know, example data set. Um, uh, on the right, we have the hazard function. That, that's a useful way of illustrating um, extra extrapolations. But it's a, the, represents the risk, how the risk of death changes over time. And in this example, the risk is decreasing. So here's an alternative uh, parametric survival model, the log logistic. So the risk follows a different curve. So you've got a different extrapolation. So what do you do? How do you make a decision? And it's a common practice, I think, in this area to fire up your software and fit all of the survival models that that software provides, and then see what the answers are under each of these different survival models. And so how, how do we weigh that up? And there's different things that people do. You can judge the short-term fit to data using statistical measures like AIC. And in the long term, it's, it's a bit more difficult because there's some more judgment involved in there. But what we really want to do is build in data and information about the longer term. Um, this might come from several sources. You might have data on the, the general population, on um, a kind of all-cause uh, mortality. You might have uh, data from a registry for the from people with the disease that you're you're studying. Um, you might want to maybe elicit judgments from experts about specific your long term survival probabilities. Um, you might assume things like cure, so people you know might um, be cured of a disease, so the hazard from of death from that disease reduces to zero at some point. So we want to use this kind of information in a in a way which is which is clear to decision makers, transparent, and also statistically principled. And we can do this. There's lots of ways that you can do this. Um, so here's, here's a couple of review papers that you know, reviewed methods for building in external data um, to survival models. Uh, it's a couple of papers in medicine decision making, a nice kind of review paper on advanced uh, methods for survival models by, the, by NICE DSU. Um, those different methods. But, the problem here is there's so many different methods, methods and so many ways of doing this. And it's a, I think it's a kind of a confusing field for, for new users. And how, how do we make sense of all this? And 
I was, I've been interested in this for a while, but I think that I, when I was coming back to it, the, the thing that I thought was missing most of all was, was a tool, just a simple tool um, in which people could um, put in their data and put in what you believe, your judgments, and stick it into this tool and what you get out is the answers that you want. Um, and I was thinking to how to formalize the what, what, what should a tool have? It should in, incorporate all available data that you can uh, might you might get. It could it should fit that data as well as possible. Any assumptions that you make while modeling, it should be be clearly stated. Um, there should be a way of quantifying uncertainty in the results. And perhaps most importantly, it should be easy to use or else nobody's going to use it. So in, in my view, the, the methods which are nicest um, from this kind of this review of methods are those which are based on Bayesian uh, multi-parameter evidence synthesis because they, you, they quantify uncertainty. They could be made to be, be flexible and fit the data. But the thing that their weak points, you know, traditionally has been their pretty you know, advanced, you know, they, they require, they have required specialized programming expertise in the you know, Bayesian software, such as bugs, JAGs, and STAN. And some, and they need kind of statistical skills to be able to understand what they're doing. So um, my kind of idealistic goal with developing this package is trying to uh, break down this barrier um, to make this then easy to use in software and to make the other your your assumptions transparent. And um, you, you're still going to need a little bit of expertise to you to understand what it's doing, but hopefully it's going to uh, break down this barrier somewhat. So this, this is what this is what I've got so far. So this is a there's a package uh, which is it's now in kind of beta status um, in that it's kind of ready to use. And there's a, there's a preprint paper, which I've just published on archive. There's a package for Bayesian survival modeling, which includes external data to ex aid extrapolation. Uh, it's based on a flexible spline-based parametric model. It uses Bayesian estimation, MCMC, using the STAN, um, as its STAN software as its computational engine. And the, the principle is that you know, that you put in your data and your assumptions are, are made transparent. You say what you know, and then the computer does the, the hard work. So I'll give you a rapid tour. Um, I don't know how much time we've got. Like, I'm, sorry, I'm sticking to time. What's the uh, end you've point? You've got 11 minutes. Right. Including that's, questions. that's good. Thanks. So I'll give you a rapid tour of what it can do. And at any time at the end, I'll go into technical details. So I'm going to miss out a lot of the, the technical details, but we, if there's time, we can revisit those at the end. So, so here's here's the basic, you know, standard model that it fits. We've got a survival curve here, and some survival data, and the aim is to fit that data as well as possible. So this is a short. We're not extrapolating that. It's just short-term fit, and it's fitting a spline-based kind of a bendy line that fits the data as well as possible. That's a fairly easy thing to do. So the, the example here is from a, a paper by Dio et al. Today, head and neck cancer trial data, um, which I'll use to illustrate all these methods. So this is a kind of the, the, the fitted hazard function. You see those wiggly lines there. It's it's it, it, it's based on a, a spline. So, and there's the R syntax down at the bottom. It's hopefully that's familiar to anybody who's fitted a survival model in R. You've got the serve uh, formula. You just that's all you do, stick in your data and fit the model. That's the simplest possible model um, to the short-term data. What we want to do is extrapolate into the longer term. So how do we do that? So the default, if you don't specify anything else, the default is to use a constant hazard after the end, after the last point in your data. But that's often not uh, plausible. You might want to assume that the hazard might go up or go down in the future. Um, and in order to do that, the first thing you have to do is to say, how far do you want to extrapolate up to? So if you want to extrapolate up to 20 years, you would add what's called a spline knot, and that will allow the hazard to change in the long term. It could go up or it could go down, um, but what it does is driven by what data you've got. And in this example, we don't have any data beyond the follow-up point of the trial. So the model will assume only that the hazard function is a smooth function of time. It won't assume that it's going up. It won't assume that or it's going down. And what the basic model does here is to represent uncertainty. So you've got a massive 
incredible interval about that extrapolation, long-term extrapolation, because you don't have any data beyond your, your trail. You've, only, you've simply assumed that the hazard is smooth. You don't know if it's going to go up or down. So it's, I think it, it, does, it, it does what you've told it to do. You've got the data and you've got your, your assumptions, but and it's reflected that uncertainty. So how, how do, in, in practice, it might be not wise to use this for your know, firm, firm decision making. We want to build in more information and judgments. OK. External data on the long term. So this, this is the, um, the way that you can build in observed data on the long term. So long term observed data is, is often in this kind of form, or it can be manipulated into this form in, in the form of counts. So counts of survivors of a series of time intervals, the number of people alive at one point, and then the number of people who are still alive at a number of years in the future. So in this example, we've got annual data on annual survival and counts of annual survival rates. Um, and this, this is from a registry of cancer patients who are assumed in this example to have sim similar survival to the control group in this trial. And we would build a joint model, a joint Bayesian model for the trial data combined with this external data. And the posterior we get, the posterior distribution that we get represents um, what we've learned from all that data combined. So we, remember before we had this very wide credible interval, um, but we're building into the model here is this, this data, here's the observed data represented as, as kind of annual mortality rates or annual hazards. Uh, so that's the data and the posterior we get is a synthesis of the trial data with this long-term external data on uh, mortality rates from the register. And so we've got our extrapolation here, this purple band, that's our posterior um, distribution for the hazard as a function of time. And our extrapolation has become more confident. Um, we can extrapolate up to, um, we've done it up to, up to 25 years in this, uh, in this case. Okay. Ex external data what's next okay so what if we wanted to go even further and extrapolate up to uh, 40 years um probably not that interested in the, in this specific example most people have died by 20 years but in, 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 supposing you wanted to extrapolate up to 40 years um so the first thing you do you you add some more knots to acknowledge that maybe that hazard is going to go up or down um in 30 40 years and you might want to build in data from the general population. You usually, you've usually got, got good information from national um, agencies on national mortality, by, by, at least by age and sex. So in this example, we, uh, we got um, population rates from people who are similar to the people in the trial. And we built those in as fixed um, background hazard rates. Um, and we model the hazard for trial by patients as this additive function, so a fixed background plus an excess, and the excess hazard is going to be estimated from the data. So this is um, this is representing the assumption that the the risks for the people um, with cancer are going to be no lower than the risks for for the general population. And if you and if you build in that those population mortality rates, then you can constrain your extrapolation to be um, no, um, uh, no, no, survival is no better than the general population. So it's still kind of doing the sensible thing here. So it's, it's still it's still fairly uncertain. Um, and what, what other kinds of information might you build in to make that more confident in, in situations where you have this information? Um, you could use expert judgments. So suppose, for example, you wanted to judge that the survival is going to be similar to the general population by a certain you know, far point in the future, so 40 years. There's no actual evidence of that from the data, so it might, it's probably not a sensible thing to do in this example because you can see the, the excess hazard for the people with cancer is still quite, quite uh, still a bit of a gap there at the end of that. Uh, so, um, to suppose you wanted to say that the survival probability is seventy percent because that's from the population data, but you want to put some uncertainty around that, maybe some credible interval, and you can use a kind of trick here. This this comes from Bayesian. Um, theory is that a, a probability of 70 percent with a certain interval is equivalent to having observed 700 700 out of a thousand people and that number of thousand there is related to the width of your uncertainty interval so if it was 10,000 then that uncertainty interval would be less 
if it was 100, then the, the interval would be wider. So this comes from the kind of the conjugate, technically it's conjugacy of the beta and the binomial distribution. So this is converting an elicited survival probability to a count of survivors. And this, this is a good thing to do in this software because then you can append those survival counts to the external data you had before and then just put everything together. You've got a big external data set um, that tells you and gives you information about survival at different times. So we've built in this, yeah, this is survival here. And then we, that, and that's achieved um, this kind of shrinking of the, the extrapolation. You've pulled it towards that elicited probability. And this is the full evidence synthesis here. You've got the trial data, registry data, general population data, and elicited survival probabilities all combined in a Bayesian evidence synthesis. Okay. A couple of things left. Um, uh, yeah, you can also fit mixture cure models um, in the software. And it's another way of um, representing a belief that the hazard or the excess hazard decreases to zero over time. And there's no actual evidence in this in the data. So it's still, it's still quite uncertain that there's not, not as much shrinkage here. Mixture cure model. So uh, one question you might have is how are treatment or covariate effects handled in this? Framework, so you could use a proportional hazards model. That's the, the default thing that it does. Um, it also has a kind of non-proportional hazards model. I won't go into the details of it. It's quite quite technical, um, and you can inco also incorporate an assumption that the uh, treatment effect decreases over time when you're predicting over models, which is something people often want to do because you know, to uh, building kind of conservative scenarios of, of, of the effects of a drug. Okay, um, I'll wrap up with this, this final slide. Um, further information is in the um, preprint paper and the website has got full documentation and some lots of worked examples. So it's beta status, it's not expected to change drastically um, before this kind of full CRAN release, but we've, we're, we're planning to do some more, more testing uh, to make sure that you know, it it's, it's, does sensible things in a, a range of realistic situations. And there's loads of technical details I haven't mentioned today, like how, how do you define priors, how, how that wiggly spline function is defined, how do you compare fit of different models. Um, and you can produce the interesting outputs like restrict mean survival, what, what can it do? Uh, and yeah, so we've got some, some simulation studies to, uh, planned to assess if those defaults are sensible. And, but I would like people to use it because I think it is usable. At, I think I think it does it does work um, hopefully, um, but I would like to know if it, if it meets people's needs. Is it usable? Do you understand what it does? And if if there's anything that's not clear or, or is challenging, how can we kind of break down those barriers to um, this kind of? I think is a nice principled method. So, thank you. I'll finish that. I didn't see any questions online. We've got time for a couple. Is there any in the room? So um, it's often the case that we um, see not like registered data as you see year on year, but we have like discrete data, like at five years, 10 years, uh, elicited, for instance, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and then the proportion of like people alive at that yeah. point, or even a range. How would the new package deal with that data? It doesn't have to be a year. Right. It can be any time interval. All you need to you know, know is the number of people alive at the start of the interval and the number of people still alive at the end, end of the interval. Right. And it would be OK with a range of proportion of people arrive at those points in time, like between, I don't know, 5% and 15% at 10 years. Ah, yes. So that's um, the, the so uncertainty around. Um, yeah, yeah. I, that, I think that's this here. Okay. Is you can convert that into a count, essentially. Very good. Okay, that's very helpful. <clears throat> Hi, Mike Sweeting from AstraZeneca. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, really, really nice work you've done here. Um, I was just wondering, in, in your example, you had um, you had trial data, then you had registered data, and I think your population mortality was maybe forming more the long term. Uh, I suppose there could be situations where the data overlap in time, and there might be potential 
conflicts or things? How does the kind of methodology? Yeah. Well, it? yeah, that's interesting because you just in this example, you, I've just stuck all the data in. Um, the population data covers the whole time range. So you and your registry data is covering five to twenty-five years, and and the model gives you the posterior. But if you, you you might if you're using in practice, it is yeah, as you say, it's good practice to check for disagreement between different sources of uh, of information. And if you find any disagreement, then try to think about why there is disagreement and try to explain it. Um, so that might lead to your you're extending your model to introduce, I don't know, covariates maybe to explain why the different data sets have different, um, or, or, or maybe exclude data that you think are not are not relevant to your, 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 your question. But it's sometimes, you, it's, yeah, it's a default, and it's, you can chuck all your data in, but, and it gives you an answer, but yeah, you still have to think about what you're doing. Um, you have one question in the chat. Oh, okay. Sorry, do you want to read it out? Read it out? Uh, yeah, so one question for you. Does, so Hugo Pater from University of Bristol, does assuming that the knots are at the time point at which we've elicited info restrict the function to some degree, i.e. these are forced to be turning points when they may in fact not be? Yeah, um, that's a good question because it's uh, the spline function is, is, is somewhat of a black box. So I'm, I'm talking about... I said that the package is supposed to make all of the assumptions transparent, and you know, it's you can see what it's doing. But the spline has a very specific definition about how it works in terms of where these knots are and these turning points and what kinds of functions it it ends up with. Um, the the goal is to have defaults which don't affect the results too much, and we're, we're planning to you know do some work to make sure that we've got sensible. Um, defaults, but um, if ideally, if the choice of where you put your knots matters in turn, if it changes your results, then I think that's kind of evidence. I mean, to, to me, that you probably don't have enough proper data um, to constrain what you've done. And it, so, yeah, I think this is this is um, work in progress. I think is the answer. Um, the, the spline doesn't have, the, the knots don't really have to be turning points, but I don't know. I, I, I won't go down the, the technical rabbit hole there. This is the second question. Um, on I'm, I'm not sure I follow that question, to be honest, about what differences. I think you the question is in there, yeah, it's about other functions that are in the package because you mentioned splines, but I think my reading of that was, does it have other functions other than splines? No, it doesn't. And this is a deliberate design choice, is that it does one, it's got one model, and that model is supposed to encompass any kind of um, ch hazard change that you might um, think. And, and the idea is that it's different from standard parametric models because in a standard parametric model, you, you fit, fit it to the short-term data and you've got a shape, and then that restricts how your extrapolation behaves in the long term. Um, but with the spline model, um, it's not supposed to do that because you, 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 have, you have to allow it to, to be able to change in the future, if need be. Cool. I think we're going to move on to the next talk. So yeah. round of applause for... Yeah.